This is an A-level biology presentation on surface area to volume ratio. To get started, there are three main methods for the movement of substances covered in the GCSE specification. Diffusion, osmosis, and active transport. All you have to do is come up with a definition for each one. And then the question for an extension is, why do mice have faster heart rates than elephants? And we'll explore that as we go through the presentation. Pause the presentation now, come up with your definitions, and when you're ready, you can restart. So diffusion is the net movement. Remember, net means the overall movement, the combined total movement of substances from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. I would always recommend you adding on about the fact that no ATP or no energy is involved, no additional ATP or energy is involved. In osmosis, osmosis, of course, we only talk about the movement of water, and we talk about movement of water from a high water potential to a lower water potential through a semi-permeable membrane. And lastly, active transport is, of course, the net movement of substances from an area of low concentration to high concentration requiring the use of ATP. In this presentation, we're going to go through the concept of surface area to volume ratio and some of the implications of surface area to volume ratio in terms of metabolic rate and in terms of heat loss. To get started, you're going to need to be able to calculate the surface area and volume of certain shapes. Using X, Y, and Z, so not actual numbers, calculate the surface area of one face. Then how would you calculate the surface area of the cube? How would you calculate the volume of the cube? And then what is surface area to volume ratio? Whenever you're ready, restart the presentation and we can see how you performed. Pause now. Well, to calculate the surface area of one face, we simply have to multiply x times y. You could talk about x times z would give you the face of one side of the cube as well. So either of those would be absolutely fine, but normally it's x and y. To calculate the surface area, well, we just get the area of one face, and then we multiply that by the fact that there are six faces. So it's six multiplied by x times y. In terms of volume, it's length, depth, and height. So it is x times y times z. And then what we do is we simply take the total surface area calculation and the total volume calculation, and we put them and express them as ratios. And that's how we calculate surface area to volume ratio. Now, when we're actually doing it as a number, instead of doing it as a ratio, we can do the surface area divided by the volume, and that will give us an actual value. If you're asked to express it as a ratio, you need the two dots. If you're not, you can just calculate a number that represents the surface area to volume ratio by getting surface area divided by the volume. So we've got a couple of questions to get started. Calculate the surface area to volume ratio if the length of the cube was 10 centimeters, and then do the same calculation, but this time if the length is 5 centimeters. Pause the presentation now, and when you're ready, you can restart and check your answers. The answers are, when calculating the area of one face of the cube, it's 10 multiplied by 10, which gives us 100 centimeters squared. Calculating the surface area, we multiply that number by 6 to get 600 centimeters squared. Calculating the volume is 10 times 10 times 10, which is 1,000 centimeters cubed. And then we express that we can do 600 dot dot to 1,000 or 600 divided by 1,000, which gives us 0 0.6. When we're going through the other example, we do exactly the same calculations, but obviously we use the value of 5 rather than 10, and we end up with a surface area to volume ratio of 1.2. You do need to be able to calculate the surface area and volume of some specific shapes. They may give you the calculation in the exam, but my suggestion is that you learn those calculations off by heart so that if they do come up in the exam, you are perfectly able to handle those type of questions. So how do we actually interpret the data? First off, we've done the calculation. Now we need to actually put together what it means. My suggestion is that when you're doing surface area to volume ratio, you work out the calculation, work out the values, 
and then completely separate you do the interpretation and then you tie it together so in terms of interpretation you should remember that a small object will have a large surface area to volume ratio and a large object will have a small surface area to volume ratio and that's because a large object has a really big volume and a really big surface area whereas a small object has a really big surface area but quite often a very small volume if we have a small object with a large surface area to volume ratio it will lose heat really fast diffusion will occur really really fast if you imagine the cube if you put something in the very center of the small cube the time it takes for that to get to the outside of the small cube is much quicker than if you put the same object in the center of the big cube where it'll take a lot longer to get to the outside so on a large object we have a small surface area to volume ratio which means that heat is lost very slowly which means that the rate of diffusion is slow so why do mice have faster heart rates than elephants well if you were to do a surface area to volume calculation you would find that the mouse has a much higher surface area to volume ratio value than the elephant. What that means is the rate of heat loss in the mouse is much faster than the elephant. As a consequence, because both organisms generate their own heat, the rate of respiration, which is an exothermic reaction, is faster in the mouse. If the rate of respiration is faster, it needs a faster rate of oxygen supply so a higher rate of oxygen supplied that means that it has to have a higher rate of blood transport so the blood's got to be pumped around faster which means it'll have a much higher heart rate notice we haven't used any particular values but if we were to get a question I would do the interpretation that we've just done there without going to the values and then work out the values as a separate calculation Throughout this entire unit, Fick's law will come up. Diffusion rate is proportional to three things. It is proportional to the surface area that we're diffusing across, the difference in the concentration either side of the surface that we're diffusing across, and it's inversely proportional to the length of the diffusion pathway. That means the smaller the length of the diffusion pathway, the faster the rate of diffusion. If we increase the surface area or we increase the difference in the concentration, we will also increase the diffusion rate. So when it comes to adaptations and exchange surfaces, any location inside an organism where substances are exchanged, often by diffusion, these rules will apply that we will increase the surface area to the maximum. We will maximize the difference in concentration and we minimize the length of the diffusion pathway the length that the substances have to travel across to get from one location to another come up with some adaptations in different parts of the body and think of how these things may be actually accomplished pause the presentation and when you're ready we'll give you some examples so how are the exchange surfaces adapted well there's a number of ways if you think of blood capillaries, blood capillaries have a big difference between the surface area and their volume, hence they have a large surface area to volume ratio. They're also quite thin. The lining of a capillary is only one cell thick. We can also talk about the fact that we have a transport system that's constantly moving substances around to maintain concentration gradients. And a good example of that is when you think of alveoli and gas exchange in the lungs. Again, everything ties back to Fick's law. So if you are given an exam question and it asks about explaining how something is adapted to maximize the rate of diffusion, you have to link the structural feature that you're looking at. So for example, thin walls, and you have to link it with one of the factors mentioned in Fick's law. If you do that, then you're explaining how the rate of diffusion is affected. So just to finish off, 
You've got a simple task. All you have to do is talk continuously about the material covered in this lesson for two minutes without stopping. You are allowed to pause for a breath, but if you are pausing repetition or just basically stalling, or you make a mistake, you've got to start again. You can talk to a family member, pet, talk in the mirror, talk to yourself, talk to whoever you like, but you should set yourself the challenge and see how many times it takes before you're able to do it. Good luck.